Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Richard. How are you doing? Uh, I'm in a freezing cold Boston. You are in a lovely warm <laughs> Jamaica. You in I Kingston? Am, I am. No, I'm in Montego Bay. You're in Montego right Bay. Oh my God. I'm looking outside. The, the, the sea is beautiful. It's the Caribbean Sea. The weather is perfect. I'll try and get some B-roll so I can share it with the viewers. You do. Yeah, just uh, just remind all the rest of us how awful the uh, the weather here on the East Coast is. Listen, you can work from anywhere in the world. Why not? That's true. Well, I was in I was in Nashville this week, um, so yeah, I don't have any excuses. I will be uh, yeah, oh, we'll be probably shooting this in Spain. <laughs> there you go. Cool. Well, another big week uh, in the news. Uh, Apple are in the news. Nvidia are in the news. Microsoft's in the news. I mean, all the same characters are back again, but. Let's start with something really kind of tangible. I have just acquired this thing. This mm -hmm. is called uh, Plaud Note, and it is a GPT-powered device. This is what it looks like. It's like a credit card nice size. Thing. And you, uh, you hit the record button, and it uses GPT to transcribe your voice into the appropriate type of transcript. So you can transcribe it into... Uh, a keynote, you can transcribe it into interview notes. Uh, but yeah, we often talk about these software products. Uh, now we actually have started to see physical products with GPT enabled on them. Um, so let's, why don't we start there? Because Humane, sure. which um, started uh, getting us excited about physical AI products at late last year, brought out this uh, kind of teaser product, the first uh, AI um, you call it, a, I think you called it a button initially, but it's a pin, right? Yeah, the AI pin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about that. That's, uh, they've actually uh, just announced something regarding their pin. Sure. So I think Humane captured the world's attention with the TED Talk by the founder. And uh, last year in mm -hmm. around November, they announced that they were going to be shipping. We saw the first preview of it. But I think for most people that saw that initial launch video, they, they were underwhelmed. I thought that the energy in the video is pretty low. And so I think they did a reset and they mm -hmm. brought back a new launch video. It's clear in terms of what they're offering as a product, but it, it still leaves me with so many questions, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how is it better than your phone combined with your watch and a headphones? Because as you're saying, you do have solutions now on device where you can basically use Siri or Google powered by Gemini or even chat GPT natively to do a lot of things hands-free. And they're, they're selling that as a solution. I think it's a great thought experiment, but what I think they really miss the boat on is their operating system. They call it Cosmos and it basically is a voice powered AI operating system. And what I think they should do is to take this, open source it, and make this the standard operating system for ambient computing devices. Yeah. That I think would be a, a huge victory. But I, I think the hardware itself leaves a lot to be desired. It's six ninety nine for the device plus a $24 per month fee. Mm. And at that point, you're thinking, well, you still need your phone or a computer to access a lot of the features and the functionality that you'll need to use the device for. So mm -hmm. why exactly would you want it? What is the value proposition? Right. I, I think that's something that they still need to look at. They still need to find product market fit. And this is a very expensive way of doing that. Yeah, it's a little like the, uh, the Vision Pro. It's like, who exactly <laughs> is this for? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Apart yeah. from that, you know, that, that really, you know, future forward person who is trying out something new or innovating around some new ideas, it's not clear that there is product market fit. So exactly. Let, on the topic of Apple, because obviously a lot of these device uh, forward products are interesting from that point of view, from a consumer point of view, the big player in the market is Apple. They have been a little late, and you've talked about this a lot on the show. They've been late to the AI story, but they just announced a, a new set of partnerships. Let's talk a little bit about Apple. Sure. I think Apple is in a very interesting place because, of course, they have the lion's share of that affluent market and they have done great with their devices over the years. Mm. And we didn't hear much from them last year. They do put out research on a weekly basis with machine learning information, but nothing to the extent that you're seeing from the Googles and the Amazons and the mm -hmm. OpenAI and Microsofts of the world. Mm -hmm. And that led me to believe that they were really behind with their technology and with their approach to AI. And I, I think that is correct. 
we're hearing now that they're exploring partnerships with Google and even had conversations with OpenAI to bring their models to power maybe Siri and some cloud-based AI functionality. Apparently, they're working on their own AI models to work on device. That will give you the privacy, that will give you the speed. But just like today, when you ask Siri certain things and it needs to go to the cloud and fetch the data, we're thinking that that's going to be a model that Apple will eventually bring to consumers where you may be able to choose your model, just like you choose your search engine for Safari. Um, and that could be a lucrative source of income for Apple. Now, the, the additional layer to this is that with all the devices that Apple has, they need a lot of compute. And so no, it's not just about the model, but do they have the infrastructure to serve these models over their wide consumer base? And the answer is no. So they're going to need to rely on a partner like an AWS or a Google or a Microsoft to say, hey, can you bring the servers and, and that compute so that when people are doing their inference and asking questions to a chat GPT or a Gemini, that you'll be able to serve it to them without the, the latency and the lag. And so I, I think they're trying to solve multiple problems. And rather than trying to eat the entire elephant right now, it is smart to say, hey, let's start with a partner that has the infrastructure, that has the models, and let's see how, if there are mistakes, if there are hiccups that happen along the way, guess yeah. what? Apple won't be blamed because they'll just say, hey, you know what? That's Google's model that messed up or that's OpenAI's model that's that's messing up. So we'll see. It's, it's interesting because we already saw Samsung and Google announced AI phones that are coming later this year. And we know Apple has said directly that they will be bringing AI to their um, phones later this year. So mm -hmm. we, we have a lot to look forward to from them. Well, the things we do know for sure about Apple is they're secretive. So we really don't know too much about what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah. They've got more money than most companies. So they certainly could build any kind of solution or buy any solution that they want to. Yeah. And then we also know that they're not afraid to do partnerships. We saw the Apple card or Apple Pay card, uh, that was a partnership. It didn't work out, but they're mm -hmm. certainly willing to experiment with partnerships. So we, we know those three things to be true, we'll, true, and we'll see what happens over the next couple of months. Exactly. Cool. Um, let's shift our attention to something that's happening across a lot of different domains, but specifically uh, want to talk about YouTube and the Department of Homeland Security. First, YouTube have... Uh, started to talk a little bit about how we can label AI specific content so that we can differentiate between that and its native forms. Why is this important? Why do we care? Should we even care? Yeah, I, I, it's hard to say right now. Of course, it's an election year and a lot of these AI providers have committed to ensuring that there's transparency and to fight against deep fakes and misinformation with these new AI models that can create so like great synthetic data that just appears real. The question for me is, if you were watching a movie, would you want to be told that this part was AI generated or this part had a real actor? So I, I think there are two sides to the story. Yes, you need to establish trust between the viewer and the, and the creator. But at the same time, to what extent? What about people that want to create memes or caricatures of real life? Is it important to say, oh, this is just for comedy, or this is a meme. Um, of course, the, the safety concern is legitimate. That's a major issue that needs to be handled with models. However, how it's being approached, there's, there's just a big question as to whether or not it's practical, whether or not Google can actually detect content. They're saying they will also label content automatically if they detect that it is AI generated. Yeah. yeah, so we'll, we'll ultimately see. But yeah. ultimately, these are questions that should be asked. These are decisions that will need to be made over time. Yeah. Um, and, and as a parent, I actually err on the side of, you know, I'd, I'd rather go too far down this road and then back up a little bit mm -hmm. um, than experience what we did with social media, where there was no regulation, there was no foresight, uh, and it obviously blew up. And now we've got massive rates of suicidal young people mm -hmm. and actually suicidal older people uh, because they are kind of, you know, confined into these unreal existences that social media has created. Okay, yeah. so let's talk a little bit about what Homeland Security is doing, because this is both interesting and scary. Uh, we see that Homeland Security hasn't always had the best record for using their power and technology for good. So what can we expect to see from them as they enter into the world of AI? So this is when AI starts to really become real. When a lot of people think of AI, they're thinking, Hey, we're generating images online or we're yeah. generating text with ChatGPT. But the reality is applied AI does so much more. 
the image generation and text generation is just one small bit of what you're going to be seeing from AI technologies uh, moving forward. And uh, what you're seeing from DHS is something that we should expect from basically every government organization. They will be looking to cut costs. They will be looking to figure out how they can become more efficient and deliver more value to the, the country. But with that said, it is DHS. And whenever you think of automated systems, it brings to mind all the errors that you have seen in the past, marginalization, misuse of this technology. And so we, we really need to be careful right here. The three pilot projects that they have announced for $5 million are around USCIS. So basically helping an immigration officer for training. And that could be really interesting. So it's not something that's going to be public facing where the AI is actually um, implementing something in real time. But if you can use it to better train immigration officers, I think that could be a win. You're seeing it with, with FEMA looking to distribute resources and to mitigate hazards when it comes to natural disasters. That could be also a, a very good thing. And then when it comes to Homeland Security investigations, there's a lot of human trafficking, unfortunately, in the U.S., and they're hoping to leverage AI to combat child sexual exploitation and also yeah. fentanyl abuse. And so the, the three projects, I think, are pretty exciting and potentially hopeful. However, as with anything, it's going to be important that the public is aware that these conversations are happening, these projects are happening, and that there can be healthy debate on both sides as to how we move forward. Right. <clears throat> Five million dollars is also not a significant amount of money. So, you know, maybe this is just a toe in the water or maybe a signal that they're trying to, to you know, lean into this and tell the world that they're not going to be left behind. Exactly. Yeah. OK, cool. Uh, some of the new tools out there. Uh, this one was actually really exciting for me. So GitHub has announced that they can actually scan and automatically fix bugs. So they're not just uh, notifying engineers that there are bugs, but they're fixing them as well. This is a big deal, especially as somebody who's in the SaaS world, who uh, works with products that are buggy, you know, just because of the nature of, you know, entropy yeah. <laughs> and software, <laughs> software goes that way. Um, the idea that there is something crawling your software and fixing it is amazing. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So, so first of all, let's put this in context. After what we saw with Devin last week, an autonomous AI software engineer that can yeah. basically run on its own. Mm -hmm. This feels pale. However, it is Microsoft, it is GitHub, and a lot Except of people. the fact that most of the software that's out there is in maintenance, not being created. So I think yeah. this is actually a bigger deal. And, and, and you'll have enterprise adoption because of the guarantees and the safety precautions that Microsoft has put in place behind the scenes. Yeah. And what we're seeing here is, is really exciting because the numbers speak a lot. They're able to cover 90% of the bugs that you see like in JavaScript and a lot of the web-based technologies. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're able to see a 7x efficiency gain with security and with developers when they're using these tools. And this is a huge win for the cybersecurity landscape because when you think of cybersecurity, usually companies have to be on the defensive. They, they have to react when there is a breach. And no, if you have like an AI just always constantly scanning, and as soon as it detects something, it can quickly fix it. I mean, this will change the game and hopefully put a little bit more advantage in the hands of the defenders. So I'm excited to, to see this rollout. I'm excited to see companies have this in action and have their hands on it. Yeah, for the consumer, this is a big deal. Or for the enterprise customer, this is a big deal because a significant proportion of engineering is in bug fixing, okay. maintenance, QA, and stuff like that. So the cost of maintaining these products should theoretically come down. Not sure if those cost savings will be passed through to the end user, we'll see. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, smart companies will be, um, would be good, you know, they'll be willing to lean into that conversation and ask the questions, hey, using all these tools, we know it's costing you less to maintain and build these things. Why are we not seeing those cost savings? And in a, an environment right now where a lot of tech consolidation or stack consolidation is happening, mm -hmm. I think those are good questions and they're worthwhile questions for, for software acquirers to ask. Yeah. And one thing I'd add, Richard, what you'll also see here is that the overall barrier to entry and to maintain software products will just be so low mm -hmm. that you'll be able to have smaller teams that can deliver a lot more value than they would have been in, in the past. And so this is going to be a huge boon just for startups that are looking to maybe develop a, a specific solution, both on the creative side and then also on the maintenance side. 
totally. And as a, as a product leader, I'm super excited about the idea that we've got smaller teams. Smaller teams aren't just more cost effective. They're also more efficient. There tends to be a mm -hmm. high degree of alignment between, you know, company goals and outputs or outcomes. Um, so yeah, smaller team is definitely a much better solution. Cool. Um, on the fun side of tools, uh, something that my eight-year-old son is obsessed with is Roblox. <laughs> Roblox um, is somewhat of a competitor to Minecraft, which is a, a Microsoft company. But Roblox is growing exponentially, and they're adding additional features right now that are AI-powered. What are we seeing? So, you know, Roblox is one of those sleeping giants. We, mm -hmm. we, we talk about the metaverse, and I think we were a couple of years early just having those conversations, but I do believe that tools like Roblox will be massive in the next two, three years moving forward. Now, Roblox has been playing with AI over the last year. We have seen different AI solutions, our own safety in conversations, translations, real-time translations in conversations. And now these two tools, I think, will be a huge win for creators on the platform. The first is the texture generator. And so if you're creating a product or a tool or a building in Roblox, you'll be able to use natural language to say, hey, I want to make this chest out of wood. I want to make this building out of brick or out of concrete. And the AI goes off and it creates this 3D mesh for you. And you can export this to different tools. And yeah. so this will be massive when you think of world creation and world generation as the graphic capabilities get better, um, this could be a big deal and enable a lot more people to start creating on the platform. Mm -hmm. And the, the second feature is the avatar auto setup. Now, when you think of creating digital avatars, this has been very complicated in the past. You needed to create the models and rig them and then spend a lot of time trying to get them animated you'll be able to do this automatically. That is a game changer for people yep. creating sure. their avatars. And, and so it's a lot of fun. It's a space that will just push creativity, but bring in a lot more individuals into the fold when it comes to participating. And I, I think that's the big advantage here. How can you yep. get more people to create versus just consume? And Roblox is, is ahead of the curve with these AI features. Yeah, I think what's really important for anybody who's watching this to realize is that Roblox, Minecraft, organizations like these or games like these are the gateways to uh, young people entering into, you know, whether it's the metaverse, coding, mm -hmm. development, mm -hmm. any of those things. And so what we're doing is we're giving them more confidence to be able to create, which means that fewer, uh, fewer people will be distracted by the, the difficulty of these tools. And now being more attracted to them, you know, as I said, I've got an eight-year-old son who's very excited about this because he sees a path towards engineering uh, just be, just through, um, you know, natural language versus yes. uh, you know, having to learn Python or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, should we talk about models? We have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, there was a there was <clears throat> obviously we'll get to to GTC in a second, but um, let's talk about stability AI. This is kind of a fun thing as well. Sure. So, so I'll talk about two different companies here. And if you kind of segue from what we were just saying about 3D worlds and creating avatars and creating textures just from natural language, mm -hmm. you're seeing two models come out this week. Both are open source. The first is from Stability AI that released Stable Video 3D. And kind of rewinding a little bit, a few weeks ago, they released the new Stable Diffusion 3 with the technology that is used to power Sora also in their new models. And what you're seeing here is just a leap in performance, a leap in the, the graphics capabilities, a leap in how it can understand more complex prompts. And now they're focused on creating 3D content. And what is impressive here is that they're able to get so much consistency from any angle. So let's say you create this chair, you can look at the chair from whatever view you want. And that is pretty amazing. And so yeah. as you think of these 3D worlds, that will ultimately create, being able to generate that will be essentially important. Now, NVIDIA also released a model called Latte 3D. Mm -hmm. And what is groundbreaking here is that you can generate in milliseconds. Like the, the state of the art for generating 3D content is usually like 10 to 12 seconds, like the best models. Yeah. They're able to do it in milliseconds on their, on their GPU technology. And so imagine now being a creator and wanting to create and being able to think of an idea, use natural language, and within seconds, you're able to produce that output. It's, it's going to change the game in terms of how people create and how they think of content. 
I have a question for you. Are these tools by NVIDIA also ways for them to show off the performance of their chips? Oh, 100%. That's that's all it is about for NVIDIA. And we'll talk yeah. about that. But the, the crazy thing is that these aren't even their most capable chips. These are pretty bottom line chips that are very capable still. But by no means are we talking about the Blackwells and the Hoppers of the world. And so you're going to be able to get even more performance once you start using their state-of-the-art chips. Yeah, this reminds me of about 10 years ago, um, uh, Intel hired a company that I was running at the time to create tools like this just so they could show off the capabilities of their chips. So uh, very often what you'll see is a hardware manufacturer or a firmware designer will need to co go to a, a, a software designer or a UI designer and say, hey, make a thing that shows how yeah. this capability is reflected into the universe. And then those things were actually reinterpreted as commercial. So um, we actually worked with them to come and do some creative direction about how awesome. that would actually make it into the universe of their, you know, their forward facing advertising. Nice. Okay, cool. Something that's really exciting for me. I'm a huge Liverpool fan. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me why I should continue yeah. to be a Liverpool fan. Listen, first of all, Liverpool is at the top of the Premier League table right now. And gotcha. I, I can't I can't have it, right? I'm a Man City fan. And Listen, I, just, to, just to remind <laughs> you, a year ago, I was sitting at Anfield watching Liverpool beat Man City. No, no, sorry, Man United. Yes, Man seven, United. 7-0. Seven, so, yeah, I'm still kind of on that. <laughs> <bad>. <laughs> that, was a, that was a game. So, here's the thing. I, I think... This is just a taste of what we're going to be seeing moving forward. So Google DeepMind and Liverpool, they have had a, an extensive partnership over the years. As we know, AI and analytics has been a part of sports for a while. But what you're starting to see with generative AI is the more analytical side and the, the, the pieces where you're saying, okay, from a strategic standpoint, how can you have AI involved in strategy? And right. so they did this ex um, research experiment where they were looking to predict corner kicks. So given any corner kick, can you understand what the setup could be, what the passes could be? Can you suggest adjustments to optimize for the outcomes that you want? And mm -hmm. the results were astounding. They were able to, like a blind test wasn't able to determine the AI generated strategy from the human generated right. tactics. And so this means a lot when it comes to where- It's money ball. It's yeah. money ball. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I, I think I, I was thinking out loud and saying, you know, I wonder how far we are from having like a coach co-pilot and a manager co-pilot where you have the manager on the field, but there's an AI right beside him in real time, thinking through strategies in oh, the yeah. game to say, hey, we need to, to, to bring our defensive players like up to this side or, or we need to make this sort of substitute. It's fun. It's exciting. <laughs> it, it really is. And, uh, you know, we're in the middle in, in the States right now. We're in the middle of March Madness. Uh, that just the NCAA just kicked off, I think, last night. Um, I think that if you're an engineer and you're thinking about how to uh, apply these types of interesting technologies to sport, there are going to be Clearly, the top teams are going to spend a lot of money making yeah. their own solutions, but then there's also going to be a need for some open source value here. Uh, lots and lots and lots of teams, all the way from the Premier League, all the way down to the school systems, are going to require some kind of help. So, yeah, if you're an engineer and you're into sports, there is a green field of opportunity here for you. Exactly. And also think of even injury management and training. There, there are just so many parts within even sport and the, the different games that you'll be able to take apart and say, okay, we have the data. We now have the AI. How can we apply them in the same box and see what comes out? Yeah, no, lots and lots of fun stuff going on here. Um, okay, so the big event this week was GTC. This is probably, if not the biggest, one of the biggest AI events yeah. of the year. They kind of stole the show. NVIDIA came in there and just like <laughs> blew everybody <laughs> away. I mean, every time I turned on <clears throat> on my computer, I was like, whoa, this is another story. What are these guys doing there? So t t tell us what NVIDIA re re released and unveiled uh, because, yeah, they seem to be just dominating right now. Okay. So... I think NVIDIA is arguably the most important company in the world today. And, and that says a lot because if you think 
two years ago, three years ago, this was a company mostly associated with gaming. Sure, after the crypto wave, yeah. you had a lot of. I mean, they, they, they were tracking with crypto. I think if exactly. You, saw, you know, there's a there's a fun uh, graphic that's going around showing their share prices and and Bitcoin and <laughs> and Nvidia were basically dancing this through this thing together. Exactly. But that was the first hint that we saw that there was something going on with Nvidia. But this was by design. When you listen to Jensen Huang talk about the 20 years that they have invested in the company, the vision that they had, and how they're starting to see that come to fruition today, that speaks to the, the patience, the, the, the ambition, but also the discipline of a company that just stayed focused. And today, the, the advantage, the mode that they have is just incredible. Mm. I'm going to highlight a bunch of different announcements that came out this week, but by no means is this anywhere close to the extent of the partnerships, the tools, the research that you saw this week. This, as are, you said- Are you going to be doing um, a separate GTC show? Because it feels like it might require that. I, I think so. I, I, I hope to, because there's a lot to break down. And, and yeah, I, I think you're right. We'll likely need to do a dedicated session on, on GTC 2024. Now that it has wrapped, there is so much to digest, both from the people and the companies and the partnerships, but also just the technology. And, and right. that's where I'm going to start. So the headliner was that you now have their new Blackwell GPUs. And if you think of the biggest chip that they had last year, the, the most powerful was the Hopper chip, the Grace Hopper ecosystem. Um, but the H100s, these are the chips that power the training behind Gemini. And if there's a large language model, they're likely using NVIDIA on the back end. And so the Blackwell, the B200s, these will be the successors. And to understand, okay, who is buying these chips. These chips cost serious money, but all the big players, any serious AI contender, so you're thinking Tesla, Amazon, Google, Oracle, Microsoft, OpenAI, they're going to be the ones buying these and they're going to be building out data centers or servicing their data centers with these new chips. And why is it a big deal? Well, if you compare the H100 to the Blackwell, you'll get a 2.5x performance on training, right? So Automatically, if you're a company and you're thinking, hey, models are getting bigger, models need to be more capable. If you have more capable chips, that's a boon. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing is the power efficiency. There's a 25x improvement in power efficiency. Yeah. And so that is that is something that everybody needs to care about. And so even just for the power efficiency gains, it'll be worth it to move into to, to the black wheel. Now, the thing to understand about NVIDIA is that NVIDIA is no longer just a chip company. I don't think they ever really were. They have an entire ecosystem. And within that ecosystem, they have an even bigger ecosystem. And so if you think of the GPU, in order for you to train the large language models like the GPTs of the world and the Geminis of the world, it's not just going to be one GPU or 10. It's going to be thousands. Mm -hmm. And when you put all of them together, they need to talk to each other. And right. what NVIDIA has done, they have their NVLink system that allows all of these GPUs to operate as if it's just one GPU. Mm -hmm. And that is brilliant. He, he made a statement where he said something to the effect that they could transfer all of the data on the internet to everyone at the same time immediately. <laughs> oh <laughs> my God. <laughs> That is incredible, right? And they, they also know everything is encrypted and they'll, they'll sell the new Blackwell chips in a number of different varieties. But he was standing on stage and he was holding a, a setup in his hand and it was like a $10 billion setup. And I, I was like, wow, that is, that is just incredible when you think of where we are as, as a society today and what it's going to take to power the technologies of the future. And this is important because while people think of NVIDIA and associate them with just AI, what he made the point of sharing on stage was that this is not just about AI. It's about manufacturing. It's about autonomous vehicles. It's about safety and security when it comes to creating digital twins. Mm -hmm. It's about climate tech. And so NVIDIA is going to be that company. When you, when you watch the futuristic AI movies and you see this one company that has all of the, the servers and, and so on, I don't think it's going to be Apple. I don't think it's going to be Google. I think it's going to be NVIDIA on the back end of all of this. Yeah. You just hint to that, but they're making um, uh, products for the EV market specifically. Yes, um, and you actually have this uh, the feeling that they're, they're they might even be a replacement for Tesla at some point. 
<laughs> I, I do think so. Because what you saw with Tesla, they were the pioneers, obviously, but right. Tesla, they made their own chips. And you are seeing now this pullback with Tesla this year with their, with their stock market performance. But what NVIDIA is doing, because Tesla's chips are only available to, to Tesla vehicles, NVIDIA is creating their NVIDIA Drive Thor system and a bunch of automotive companies are signing on to use it. You have BYD, you have Hyper, you have Xpeng. And a lot of these may not be names that are familiar in the US, but these are some of the largest car manufacturers in the world today. Well, specifically e -car, EV cars, EV. right? These are, yep. Yeah, these are EV. like the Chinese, uh, Korean. These these are really big manufacturers. Exactly. And uh, so if you, if you imagine a world where a Toyota or a GMC or any other company, a Porsche, they're thinking of building out AI powered vehicles, they're going to need to rely on a provider like NVIDIA to source them with these same chips and also the servers in the data centers on the back end with all that, that intelligence to send that back to the cars when they're on the road. And so NVIDIA is really well positioned right now to, to service this market. And even if they're just running on par with Tesla or even if they're a little bit behind Tesla, the, the fact is nobody else is providing these solutions and NVIDIA is the one that's going to give you that all-purpose solution to say, hey, if you are providing your services, whether it's to the automotive industry or to healthcare, you can use our chips to do that. Awesome. They're not just going to stop there. They are actually going into the robotics space okay. as well. So tell us about Groot. Uh, and by the way, did they have to pay Marvel for that name? <laughs> <laughs> so it was funny because at the, the keynote, Jensen had uh, the, the Imagineers robots from Disney on stage with him as he spoke about Project Groot. And so I was, I was thinking, I wonder if he had to actually get the rights to the name or if, if Disney was actually working with them on some of this. But yeah. what's interesting here is a lot of the robotic stories that we have covered over the last couple of weeks, they're actually using NVIDIA's foundation Groot model on the back end. And this is an all-purpose model that is going to help a robot to understand the real world. And uh, to put this in perspective, embodied AI is the next big leap in terms of the future of AI technology. Right now, AI is confined to text and screens and it cannot experience the real world by itself. It can't have its own perspective or experiences. And with embodied AI, imagine an AI that's learning and it can now go by itself and say, hey, this is what this feels like, or this is what this looks like, or this is where this, this path will take me if I make this decision. And so I, I do think you're going to see a big shift that will happen as models like Groot get put out into the real world and robots are able to start getting that information on their own. And so NVIDIA, again, with Groot, they're partnering with a bunch of the different companies. But the, the big thing to understand here is that the model by itself is not enough, right? Mm -hmm. Again, you have to think on the back end, you do need these data centers with their black hole. Um, mm -hmm. Exactly. But they also have the Omniverse ecosystem. And the mm -hmm. Omniverse, think of it like the metaverse, but really the space that NVIDIA is creating based on OpenUSD. Yeah, it's kind of like a, the way to think about this is like a mesh network where you've got um, a certain set or networked group of uh, devices all talking to each other. So if you've got a whole bunch of groups working to understand something, let's say they're getting to dropped into a, uh, a high risk situation, like they're fighting fires or something like that. As one learns, so do the others, so that the, the training curve is exponential. So you're not just each of these things are learning, but there's a network effect and they're kind of all learning together as one, almost like a single organism. In addition to that, there is also the virtual simulation component of that. And so while it's there for the training, imagine also being able to go into this omniverse and see a digital twin of mm. the robot. And so all of a sudden the robot can have all of these virtual experiences, teach itself, play around, mm. make mistakes oh and God, learn, but also yeah. maybe interact with humans in this virtual space. And that's what you're starting to see with manufacturing where they're saying, Hey, if you need to go and build out a factory rather than going out and building out the factory and then figuring out everything that could go wrong or might go wrong, build it out in the omniverse 
test it, put in all of these elements, run all of these different simulations, and then optimize your final product for that. And, and so product development is going to change. If you imagine designing a car, building all of these products, it's right. going to happen in this, meta, in this omniverse setting first and then translate it into the real world. And the, the, the in, really interesting perspective here is that um, for years we've had this idea that we've got two sets of problems to solve. One is a set of complicated problems and one is a set of complex problems. Complicated problems are like learning how to fix a fuel injected engine, you know, as normal aspirated engine. You can take it apart, you can put it back together. It's a complicated thing, but you can learn how to do it. Complex, something like the weather or traffic patterns, these are very, very, very difficult to understand for human beings because they involve literally you know, <laughs> trillions of different sets of data. Now we're starting to see these two things blend. We've got yeah. this autonomous or embodied robotic AI that's out there in the world, experiencing the world, learning, training, at the same time as this virtual world that could be considered as the complex part of that model. And mm -hmm. these two things are starting to overlap. Tell us about the twin cloud platform, because this is a super interesting advance in terms of how we are as humans able to interact with our universe. Yes, I, I think this could be a game changer for how we look at weather forecasts, but also for climate tech. So NVIDIA showcased something called Earth2. And Earth2 is not new, but they now have APIs in the cloud that people will be able to leverage. And Earth2 is a climate digital twin of the world. Mm -hmm. And so if you think of just modeling the weather patterns, but over time, Earth2 is able to do that flawlessly. In fact, they're able to have a two kilometer precision with their forecast. And they're able to do it in seconds versus the minutes that it would take now with the state of the art models. And mm -hmm. so you're going to see this apply. The weather.com, the weather company is leveraging the digital climate twin models to improve their performance. And they're also going to be using it in Taiwan. They show this demo of a typhoon of Taiwan and just the amount of clarity that they were able to showcase. And this is going to make a, a big difference um, as the climate changes and it becomes harder for us to predict just the disastrous weather patterns, things like this will be super important for us. Yeah, so um, anybody who's involved in understanding that stuff, whether it be supply chain management or weather patterns or anything that's related to the weather, this is an API. You can actually achieve that insight, not just by building your own, but by using their API. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that that API has some kind of centralized uh, value to it as well, just like you were explaining um, about the robot tech is that you're going to have this, this omniverse version of that where you're constantly adding to it, improving it, and, and driving up the value of that data. Exactly. Cool. Uh, the thing that we often like to end with is money. We like to talk about the money that's flowing towards AI. A um, couple of big stories here. Uh, there has been this really interesting <laughs> Microsoft story, which um, probably deserves its own Netflix show <laughs> eventually. <laughs> Uh, so let's talk about Microsoft. And then, of course, we, we need to talk about Saudi Arabia because they've uh, essentially thrown the gauntlet down and said that they are going to be the, the biggest investor in AI, which makes sense given that they have the most money. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. And then the last part of this will be um, how a state and federal governments are starting to support this. So let's, let's start with, with Microsoft. This is, a, this is a weird, interesting story. I, I think we look back at Satya Nadella and there will be movies written about uh, what he has done. Well, you, well, you, said, you said Jensen's the most interesting CEO at the moment. Are you saying Satya is not like, make up your mind? <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> they're, they're running a tight race, put it that way. But I would start by saying I rose by any other name. Right. So this week, there was this incredible story that Microsoft had started its own Microsoft AI division, mm -hmm. and they were able to get Mustafa Suleiman and Karen Simonian to move from Inflection AI, this is a startup, to come over to lead and operate Microsoft AI. So in order for you to appreciate this, I'm going to need to take you a, a couple of steps back. Okay. Mustafa, he is one of the co-founders of Google DeepMind. So if mm -hmm. you think of Google's big AI division, 
this is one of the guys that founded it. And he left Google, he started Inflection, and Microsoft was able to poach him. Now, Inflection was founded in 2022. It was Mustafa, Karin, and Reid Hoffman. He was the former founder of LinkedIn, as you, you may recall. But last year, we, we did a story where we said that they raised $1.3 billion in June, and they were about at $4 billion. Now, that's a one-year-old company mm -hmm. that raised $1.3 billion and is valued mm -hmm. at $4 billion. That yeah. is now essentially defunct two years later. And mm -hmm. so there were, there were lots of questions being asked, like what's going on? Was Microsoft a villain here? Was Microsoft saving them? Maybe they just weren't working out. But they're saving them. I'm not sure what they're saving them from. And more like saving them from the competition of having to deal with them. <laughs> uh, and I think if it is, if it is, it, if it, it does turn out that they're just acquiring the, the, the talent here, then it is the most expensive acqui hire in history. <laughs> so this is where it gets really interesting. Inflection had Pi, their, their personal AI, and it was supposed to be just a more human take on AI, not just an assistant, but mm -hmm. to me and to many people, it just never it's carved out. Yep. Exactly. Right. Yep. And, and so what was interesting here, remember that $1.3 billion that they raised? Well, yep. guess who the biggest investor was? Microsoft. Microsoft. Yeah. And uh, now <laughs> all of a sudden they're on their way over to Microsoft. You may have remembered that last year with the open AI drama, Microsoft had announced that open AI, Sam Altman, Greg Brockman, and a bunch of employees were going to come over to Microsoft to start a new division within Microsoft, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't going to be an acquisition. They were leaving the company. They were coming over to Microsoft. So a lot of the government like oversight that would normally be there when you're doing acquisitions, wasn't that play here? Right. No, you're seeing something very similar. The CEOs, the co-founders of Inflection are coming over to Microsoft, but it's not an acquisition. And uh, apparently, as reported by the information, Microsoft is paying $620 million for this, plus an additional $30 million to ensure that they don't get sued by the company. And so for all intents and purposes, this looks like an acquisition. I can't imagine that they would, you know, the $1.3 million that they raised last year, there's probably absolutely no way that they actually spent that money. So that money is really coming back into the fold in some form, either in future payments for those individuals, Mustafa, or Karen, et cetera, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or it's just going to come back into the fold. So yeah, this might work out to be one of those interesting accounting stories where, as you said, they've avoided any kind of antitrust, con yep. uh, you know, visibility. But it's also, it is an acqui hire. Let's just be honest. That's what oh, it is. They're hiring, they're hiring a great team with a product that's, uh, you know, eh. And the, the, the big loser here is Google. To think that they have lost out on OpenAI, but they have also lost one of the co-founders of Google DeepMind. Microsoft is really sailing high right now. Mm -hmm. So kudos to Satya. Well played. Hopefully it works out in their favor. But for all intents and purposes, everyone seems to be happy. Reid Hoffman, he wrote a post saying that the investors are all going to end up doing really well. So whatever that means, they're, 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 <laughs> there's uh, happiness all their own. <laughs> yeah, there certainly is a lot of money in this space to go around. Okay, um, like I said, Saudi Arabia wants to be the big players in this market. Uh, really, when, we, when you say players in this market, we're not talking about necessarily, um, we're, we're not seeing a huge amount of in, uh, activity from them in terms of the manufacturing, but we're seeing a massive amount of investment. Mm -hmm. And also maybe just the creating an environment or a culture in which AI is, is uh, you know, right there in, you know, in their strategy as a sovereign nation. Um, this is mostly about money, right? This is not necessarily about stuff. Exactly. Here's the thing. The story here is that they want to become the world's largest investor. They want to start a $40 billion fund, and that's going to go into infrastructure. It's going to go into startups. Mm -hmm. It's going to go into supporting even some of these more established companies like OpenAI, because we have seen publicly, and we have companies that have spoken to us privately, that they're in the Middle East, they're having conversations with Saudi, with all of these sovereign nations, to raise money because there's a lot of money there and they're more than willing to put it into companies. I think w the only hiccup here could be if the U.S. starts to clamp down on investors in 
AI companies in the US. Yeah. Because we already see where they're starting to ensure that the, the hardware isn't accessible to different countries. So it will be interesting to see how they receive this news. But the, the fact is, countries are starting to recognize that AI is going to be a space that is going to be very lucrative for them. And yep. they're willing to put a lot of money behind it. And there is, as you said, there is no other bigger country right now with the funds more than Saudi Arabia. And so this will be pretty interesting. They're working with Ben Horowitz from Andreessen Horowitz, and he's given them some guidance and potentially working with them. And of course, that means a foot into a lot of the startups in, in the U.S. Totally. Cool. Okay. Uh, last story of the day, um, the CHIPS Act, this is um, essentially federal funding for, mm -hmm. for AI. Um, specifically around local manufacturers, they want they want you know people to be making stuff here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and uh, they want to uh, incentivize that. So Intel is going to receive a big chunk of the hundred billion dollar fund that's available. Almost ten billion of that is going to go to Intel. Um, really, what we're seeing here is the federal government supporting local manufacturing, making sure that there is competition, making sure Intel is able to stand side by side with Nvidia and others. Um, it, what do we what do we care about this? This is obviously taxpayers money. But it's also the the funds that ultimately find their way back into the Treasury funds that these are essentially loans. Mm -hmm. They're not, just, you know, these are not just giveaways. So, you know, why should we care about this stuff? So I, I think to appreciate it first, a context overview, back to NVIDIA, NVIDIA announces their Blackwell GPUs. Mm -hmm. NVIDIA is actually not manufacturing these GPUs. They need to have a fab company like TSMC right now, their main company in Taiwan that is doing a lot of this manufacturing, right? And so you're now having this valuable chip being manufactured in Taiwan. TSMC is a US company, but it is the fab is all happening mostly in a foreign nation. And what the US is essentially saying, hey, this is a priority for us. We need to bring this home. And so they're going to companies like Intel and they're saying, we'll give you uh, money if you're willing to invest in doing the fab here in the US, you'll get the money to build these chips wherever you can. And what we do know is we can't make enough chips right now. So TSMC, they are, they're at capacity. And so there's going to be more than enough work for Intel once they have their facilities online to be creating chips, not just for NVIDIA, but for AMD, for mm. um, Google's, the Microsoft's, all of these proprietary chips. Right. And so this is going to be a huge opportunity. There are four states, Ohio, New Mexico, Oregon, and Arizona that are going to benefit right now from it. This $8.5 billion fund is just the beginning. I think they're eligible to up to another $11 billion in loans. And ultimately, Intel over the next five years will be investing a hundred billion dollars. So a major deal in terms of jobs, in terms of manufacturing and opportunities in the States that the government is bringing home. But it, it, it really underscores the priority that AI and chips have taken for, for the government as a national security measure. I know. Interesting. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see, you know, it, it is an election year. This is obviously a significant investment in local manufacturing. Um, we haven't heard that much of it at the election level. Yeah. Uh, but this is a pretty big investment. Yeah, I, I think what you're seeing, there is some tug of war happening among car manufacturers and how that is going to be impacted. And so I think if you think of future car technologies, maybe bringing some of that back to the States could be interesting, but we'll see. Ultimately, as you said, there is a huge political play here, but at the end of the day, these four States and a, a, an American company yeah. in terms of Intel will be big winners. Yeah. looks like everybody benefits. Mm -hmm. Cool. Chris, what a week, man. Phew, head spinning again. <laughs> yeah, uh, and as I've, I've said, there are so many more stories that we didn't even get to cover here, Richard. So break, break the surface. Exactly. If, if you're interested, hop on over to imaginative.com. Check out the stories. You can subscribe. If you subscribe, you can subscribe for free and get a digest each week. Or if you support us and become a paid subscriber, guess what? Not only will you be helping us out, but you'll be getting additional analysis and exclusive stories from different articles that we're covering and just going a little bit more in depth. It will help you to understand why it matters and how you can apply it to your business or to your personal life. Thank you, Chris. Enjoy Jamaica. Anytime, Richard. Take care. Cheers, mate. Bye.